ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Pranab Mukherjee Legacy Foundation, I welcome you all. It's a very cold evening. So I thank, a special thanks to all of you that you have left the comfort of your home and the room heaters and you have come here to grace the occasion to be with all of us. Thank you. A late Shri Pranam Mukherjee, I don't like to use the word late for my father, but still as the custom, I would say that. So I don't think he really needs an introduction. As you all know that in his decades long career of public service, he served as key ministers in central government before going on becoming the 13th president of India. Today we have a panel of esteemed speakers who have been working with him, known him since many, many years. We have Sri N.K. Singh, who is the current chairperson of the finance, of the current, he is the chairperson of the current finance commission, a very senior IS officer, and I think, sir, you have known my father since 19, early 1970s. It's really been a long association. Shekhar Dutt, former governor of uh, Chhattisgarh, and also he was the defense secretary when Baba was defense uh, minister. And we have the celebrated writer, author, speaker, and not to miss the diplomat, former member of parliament, and a very dear friend of mine, Sri Pavan Verma. Pavan served as ambassador to Bhutan when my father was in the external affairs ministry. The Indo-Bhutan relationship was a matter extremely co close to Sri Mukherjee's heart and he once told me that we send, we as in the Indian government, send only our best officers to Bhutan. So I think Pavan, you know, from you, we would be expecting to hear some of your experience. And of course, last but not the least, we have Sri Sitaram Yechuri, the distinguished leader from CPIM. When we talk about Pranam Mukherjee, we really can't take him out of the context of politics. But I thought it will be interesting, you know, rather than inviting a Congress leader to speak about him, it will be interesting to have, to hear something from someone who has known him closely and worked closely with him, but from the other side of the aisle. And uh, as we all know that during the UPA1 government, the left troubled Congress a lot. And, uh, my father had to bear the brunt of it because as he was the main negotiator between the left and the Congress. But despite that, he was extremely fond of Mr. Yechuri and once he told me that he's a really bright young boy and he lamented that why he was not in Congress. So <laughs> we definitely want to hear you know, some interesting anecdotes from you, sir. And uh, we have Professor Dinesh Singh, the former Vice Chancellor of Delhi University, who has also closed very, uh, worked very closely with my father. So we have this, all these distinguished eminent speakers, and so we are looking forward to hear from you. But before that, we begin our program with a short AV on my father, Sri Pranam Mukherjee. Secularism and inclusion are a matter of 
feet but up. Education is the alchemy that can bring India its next golden age. Our motto is unambiguous, all for knowledge and knowledge for all. We are all across the divide of party and region, partners at the altar of our motherland. Our federal constitution embodies the idea of modern India. It defines not only India but also modernity. In my public life, I have received much more from the people from this country than I have given to you. Pranab Mukherjee Legacy Foundation is a trust set up by his daughter, that is me, Sharmishta Mukherjee along with other like-minded people to carry forward the legacy of former President of India, Bharat Ratna, Sri Pranam Mukherjee, and strengthening the core values that shaped the political life of Sri Mukherjee in his long year years of public service, spanning over five decades. Throughout his life, Sri Mukherjee revered the system and institutions of parliamentary democracy and the values enshrined in the Constitution of India. Parliament was his temple and the Constitution was his sacred text. He worked dedicatedly towards financial inclusion and firmly believed that India's own growth was closely tied to regional coordination and cooperation with the South Asian and Southeast Asian countries. In his long political career, who holding various ministerial charges, including those of external affairs, finance, commerce, and defense, he worked towards institutionalizing, facilitating, and formalizing frameworks aimed at creating a conducive environment of peace and prosperity in the region in which India would play a key role. During his presidential years, Sri Mukherjee placed major emphasis on importance of, of higher education in India and the pivotal role India could play by enhancing its research and innovation capabilities. Above all, he was a firm believer in the doctrine of bipartisan national consensus on issues of national interest. PMLF aims to focus on these five crucial areas, which are significant for the further development of our nation. PMLF was launched on 31st August 2001, the first 2021, the first death anniversary of Sri Mukherjee, and held the first edition of Pranam Mukherjee Memorial Lecture on the topic, Constitutionalism, the Guarantor of Democracy and Inclusive Growth. The lecture was delivered by the then Honorable Vice President of India, Sri M. Venkaya Naidu. PMLF is also sponsoring students from marginalized sections of society through annual scholarships, 50% of which is specially reserved for girl children. We now have a short AV showing the, the journey we have had so far. Thank you. service of his people and 
country. Sri Pranab Mukherjee contributed greatly to further strengthening the excellent relations between Bhutan and India. He had a long and close association with my father, His Majesty the Fourth King of Bhutan. I myself had close personal relations and very fond memories with him and his wife, Shubhra Mukherjee, who was from Bangladesh. He remained beside us as guardians and family friends during our difficult days in India after the assassination of my parents along with 18 other close family members on 15 August 1975. His departure was a personal loss for me and my family and I will continue to miss him and his affection. Shri Mukaji had a long and illustrious political career spanning over five decades. He was one of the most distinguished leaders of the Congress party. Pranab Da was among the few distinguished politicians who made invaluable and multi-credited contribution to the march of modern India. Himself meditate Karuna several years, then finally enlightened. So his main teaching is Karuna. Uh, in order to develop Karuna, different philosophy. I would like, now like to request our esteemed speakers to kindly come onto the dais. Now I would like to request Sri Pavan Varma to kindly say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sri Mishra, for inviting me to speak today on Pran Mukherjee Ji, who was a father, of course, but in a sense, an icon of his age. I would like, of course, to begin by first congratulating the Pranam Mukherjee Legacy Foundation for having begun work in his memory and to further his remarkable legacy. And I hope you continue to do well in the future. And you have all our support. I want to say that Pranababu was my minister when I was a diplomat on two occasions. Once in the 1990s and later in the new millennium. And one of the things that struck all of us, not only me, was his remarkable mastery of the brief. His ability to absorb detail. And his uh, sense of what 
has priority as you push for what you find achievable. You know, these are qualities which are often missing in individuals. He had the ability to focus on what is required. And in my frequent meetings with him, both when he was president, when he was minister, and even more after he retired because I used to go to see, to him, see him often. To my mind, there is no other political figure that I can recall who was truly a witness to an era. A chronicle. I remember once we were returning from Kolkata after he had gone there to inaugurate the ICCR Cultural Center in Kolkata. I was the Director General of ICCR and Dr. Karan Singh was the President of ICCR. And we were returning, he had come in an official plane, so we came back with him. As we sat down for that flight, he took out a notebook. I think Sharmishta, he never really typed. He used to write by hand and remarkable uh, calligraphy. I consider it calligraphy, the neatness with which he used to write. And while, of course, he saw to our comfort, he immediately began to work on a series of several volumes which Rupa has published of his political life. And once he told me that he keeps a meticulous diary, which I think is a, a nationally priceless document. And I say this because that is what his life was. I mean, a man who began as a clerk in West Bengal, in the Post and Telegraphs Department, worked as a journalist in a relatively minor Bengali newspaper, worked as a lecturer, to rise from there, to the post of the President of India and in the interim to literally be the person who not only the portfolios, defense, commerce, finance, external affairs, but the man who could provide the cerebral energy behind the decisions the Congress party took. I still remember once he told me that when I was young, one of my dreams was to be a member of the CWC, the Congress Working Committee. And of course, he became a member of the Congress Working Committee, but he was a man dedicated to the party, not only to the party, but to the values of the Congress, not necessarily to the Congress as it existed in every respect, but to the values the Congress imbibed. His father was a freedom fighter and a congressman. He followed that tradition and he lived by it, some of which you saw on the short AV that you show on his life, the values he believed in. The second thing that I, I was always impressed by was his capacity for hard work. We have people who have worked with him directly. Mr. N.K. Singh has been uh, his private secretary and has also worked with him closely in other capacities. I mean, for him to work till midnight was, I think, routine. And he used to have dinner at midnight and get up in the morning at 5 a.m. or whatever and do this day in and day out without almost... Uh, 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 a break in between. Uh, the amount of work that he could do uh, was uh, remarkable. The other thing is, as a both as a professional diplomat and as a, when I joined politics later, and I used to discuss the evolution of Indian politics, was uh, his uh, 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 phenomenal memory. You see, he, because of, the, I think he wrote the diary, because he immersed himself with the constitution, he could recall the exact precedent for an existing problem that needed to be resolved and quote the exact article which needs to be applied or modified as the circumstances required. Now, in my view, this, he was actually the intellectual uh, repository 
of much of the functioning of the Congress and even when he was not directly involved with the department, when there was a situation of crisis resolution, the party would go back to Mr. Pranab Mukherjee. Uh, Chandrishtha mentioned the fact that when I was ambassador in Bhutan, uh, there was a particular situation there where uh, I think Bhutan was in a bit of a crisis for shortage of uh, Indian rupees which they used to earn through exports and it was an issue which was becoming politically very sensitive. As you all know Bhutan is on the border, is the buffer between India and China and the Chinese are perpetually knocking at the door of Bhutan to gain an entry. And for us, Bhutan is strategically very important. And there came a point where since Delhi, my own ministry, perhaps for well-intentioned reasons, was not re responding in time. And I could sense uh, a sense of alienation among the Bhutanese. And at that time, Bhutan had a prime minister who was quietly playing footsie with the Chinese, uh, trying to hide it from us, which we are not against because Bhutan and India are linked in so many other ways. But then I flew down to Delhi and I sought an appointment with the finance minister, which of course was given to me. Uh, as Amitaji, who worked with him, knows that what time you would get to meet him could never be certain. So it was in the evening. So if I may confess, uh, you didn't have a drink till 9.30 because you were meeting the finance minister and then you finally met him at 10 o'clock, 10.30 or whatever time, which seemed to him normal. But when I did meet him and I explained the, the parameters, the broader consequences of a immediate decision or the lack of it. You see, he had a vision. When we talk of international cooperation, he genuinely had a vision of India's role and its position in the subcontinent and the strategic importance of nations to it in the short term, medium term and the long term. And his immediate reaction, when I said that we need a response, his face used to, when I when he used to get angry, his face used to get red. Uh, and he face got red and he said, these people, they don't understand. They don't understand anything. I remember him saying this. And anyway, he summoned uh, or spoke to the concerned senior officials. The matter was resolved. I think Bhutan was exceptionally grateful. Also, he had a ability which I saw in, in parliament uh, in terms of people who, who remembered he was a consensus maker. A minister of parliamentary affairs from his own party once told me that Pranab Babu would say that if I don't see you on this side of the aisle, that is where our party sits, you are going to get fired. You must be on this aisle, across the aisle, interacting with the opposition. That is your job. To build bridges, to build a consensus. And he was respected by the opposition because he spoke with knowledge, with gravitas, with an eye for detail and always with the aim of finding a, a synthesis. Uh, he, he, he was quite clear once I called on him when he was president at that time, uh, along with Mr. N. K. Singh, I was also working with Mr. Nitish Kumar and he said to me, ask Nitish to see me. And I did say that and we went to meet him. And uh, I accompanied Mr. Nitish Kumar to meet with him. And while I'm not going into the details of the conversation, the kind of uh, worldview he had of politics and of the role of the individual in it is uh, remarkable. And let me say with all of this, he was an extremely shrewd politician. There was a time, if I may say so now, that he was external affairs minister and he had his ministers of state and no names shall be taken and one of them seemed to be particularly uh, 
well, if not boastful, but proud of the fact that in meetings with the Congress president, he was asked to be present and began to almost assume the airs of being the main minister. And Mr. Pranam Mukherjee was observing all of this silently and a time came when he told that concerned minister bluntly that I think you need to play the role that you are assigned to <laughs> rather than try to become bigger than you are. I'm not taking names, but he could observe it. We were, as officers observing it, we got no inkling that he was aware of it. Of course, he, has his, he had his own input. And uh, 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 when I say consensus builder, this dialogue business, you know, he was criticized for after his time as I think after his retirement or while he was president for meeting with the RSS, after the president. Now, frankly, I know exactly where there is coming from. We are a civilization which has actually evolved on the strength of Maulik Soch, the power of original thought developed through Shastrat, Sabhya Samvat, of dialogue. Even with your persons with whom you don't agree with. Adi Shankaracharya and Mandan Mishra sat down and debated for weeks, although they completely disagreed with each other's point of view. This ability for dialogue, not keeping somebody untouchable, but not compromising on what you believe is right, that is the way that you build, I think, a nation where you try to create a stake, a stake for all those, even if viewpoints dif differ. Uh, finally, I would like to say that uh, he was fond of reading. I've seen him open a book and read, a voracious reader. He was fond of gardening and not surprisingly considering his talented Kathak Maestro daughter is fond of art, culture. In fact, whenever she performed, in whatever capacity he was, however busy, I think he used to make it a point to come and try and watch. And he actually enjoyed it. So I would like to end by saying that um, India was lucky. You can evaluate history in many ways. Did he deserve, no, did he get what he deserved in full measure? Was it too late or too little? Couldn't it have been more earlier without necessarily negating what happened later? Now, these are questions you can debate. And please, we should never forget that when you see the success of individuals, you have to keep in mind the periods when they were out in the wilderness. As indeed he was from 85 for five years. He was not in the Congress party. His own party did not take off. But to keep that resolve, to keep fighting, to keep true to your principles and then to come back and to be able to contribute again trying to get rid of the rancor and move ahead. I think these are great qualities. I salute him today. There are so many other fond memories, but I salute him today when I say that India was lucky to have Bharat Ratna Pranam Mukherjee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nathagam, for your such beautiful words. Now, now I would like to request uh, Sri Shekhar Dutt to kindly come and say a few words. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, unlike uh, <coughs> my previous speaker, uh, who saluted uh, Pranam Mukherjee at the end, I would like to salute the <coughs> old gentleman in the beginning. He is a remarkable person, and he deserves uh, to be applauded by everybody, and especially from those who have worked with him and seen and learned a lot. There was no, not a single day when I didn't feel that I had not learned something from him. 
It was uh, enormously uh, gratifying to be working uh, with a person with a tremendous amount of sagacity, knowledge, uh, very correct to the last. And uh, uh, you, could, you could say that, well, it was a, the classroom on which, uh, in which we were all participating and he was overseeing it. So it was a tremendously um, educative for all of us sitting. I would narrate some of the incidents which, uh, which stand out. Not that these were the most important or these were the most unique ones, but still they bring a little bit of his personality and his tremendous ideas, which, which he could bring it uh, into open and in, in the work that he was doing. Uh, we all know that he was uh, in the cabinet, he was one of the persons who uh, perhaps had the capacity of solving problems and uh, therefore he was in charge of a very large number of group of ministers. But in that process, he learned a hell of a lot of different ministries, how they were working and what they were, uh, their central theme was. And uh, he knew the total government. And I saw a glimpse of that when we started uh, the Indo-American Framework for Defense. Old uh, Mr. Vimal Julka is here, who had been associated on almost everything. And I found that uh, right in the beginning, he addressed, uh, you know, when we had a meeting with uh, Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney and others in USA, and he gave a, a, a discussion. In the discussion, he gave an idea about what they are dealing with. India is not an India uh, like a, any other country. India is India. And this is what India is doing. So Rumsfeld, who perhaps uh, was thinking that America would deal with a, with a, uh, uh, with a country with whom uh, they would have uh, an upper hand. Rumsfeld started feeling that he could learn from this gentleman. And that was the, the basic thing, and that eased our discussions. That eased our discussions enormously because uh, down the line, the State Department felt that it, they have to be uh, sensitive towards India's need. Otherwise, the State Department had been all the time thinking, the American State Department was all the time thinking that uh, India is in the Soviet camp and has been in the Soviet camp and therefore deal with India with a little bit of uh, uh, strength and, um, and say that let India cringe and ask for uh, the kind of uh, uh, accommodation. We did. And Mr. Pranam Mukherjee was quite sure that he was, he could easily put that across to Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. And we found that slowly Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, especially Rumsfeld, the Department of Defense became uh, uh, more, uh, uh, say, acceptable. And, and uh, uh, the uh, State Department be, went into the background. This was one of the huge reasons why we succeeded in, uh, in uh, getting the Indo-US framework for defense, because before that, we were uh, completely on a different side of the US-India power dynamics. And this brought India into the ability, uh, to the sphere of strategic partnership with US. Now, I <coughs> could see at all the levels how he would uh, start sort of taking the pulse by reading a document. He, and he would as if measuring the pulse of the department. And uh, I, I found that whenever you take a document, however long it might be, however crisp it might be, or however uh, confusing it might be, he would just take it and forget that you are there and you would read it. So then, <clears throat> enormously uh, 
the sensible to the paper that has been given to him and then if there is some contradictions within the paper he would be able to identify he will be able to point that out that here you have said this there we are saying something else and uh, he would point that out and <clears throat> therefore you had to prepare the paper properly and he would read it once he has read it then he would say yeah now tell and with a smile so you know that uh, well he knows as much as you know because what you know you have put down on the paper and this is uh, the hallmark of a of a person who is uh, who has not only the knowledge but also to see how we can deal with the knowledge there are many other instances which uh, were like a lesson book for me and uh, one of them was very early actually because uh, you know india and i have been associated with that for a long time since 1980s uh, when i came to the defense ministry and i was director navy i was also looking after in, in <coughs> the integrated guided missile development project with a gentleman called dr kalam who was at that time posted in in uh, hyderabad and uh, and dr kalam brought this and the integrated guided development missile went on you know so at first prithvi akash and on other uh, smaller range and then agni the longer range ones by that time uh, mr pranam mukherji was the defense minister and agni 5 the longest range of uh, the agni missiles it's a like an inter <coughs> intercontinental guided missile and we were firing that and everybody was excited and we went and it was a great disappointment the first uh, fire was unsuccessful now any other person would have sort of been saying oh no no uh, there's something wrong and we'll we'll correct it mr pranam mukherjee at that point of time told the drdo people individually and collectively that if we don't this is a great success because if you don't fail you will never su succeed and he made it a point that that because we fail we will succeed and we'll do it better we we are, we are, we are proving these 160 items but now we are going to prove 360 items and everything will be correct and we'll do it better and the way he said that within a few minutes a few uh, months time the next was successful and agni are successful missiles now this is a kind of a thing which a leader a born leader would would take and he is not a military person but this is a type of a thing a born leader would infuse the kind of confidence in the scientist in the technocrats in the military uh, personnel that whatever they do will lead us to success and even a failure is a measure of success and you know exactly why it failed and therefore you will do better and continuously that happened and in his uh, uh, way of handling top military people top scientists and top uh, uh, people from uh, whether bureaucracy or the finance he had that and he would never uh, sees learning himself and and sometimes it would be along with you it's like a jugal bandi you know in in uh, uh, as you play music and it's a, it becomes a team work and he would learn and he would understand and he would then become one up another uh, very interesting uh, phenomena i saw very closely and it was not again related uh, to uh, what otherwise would be a defense minister's work um, the following the indo american framework we had uh, american and indian air force exercises and this exercise was being done at uh, uh, the kalai konda kalai konda air port uh, air force uh, uh, 
station. And the government in West Bengal was a left government. And they said that Americans are coming, they are anti people, and they, they will, uh, they will uh, uh, and we will not allow them to come to Kalaikunda. So I, this was a day of, uh, of uh, uh, Bhai Duj, and I had gone to my sister. And I got a call from uh, the RM's or Rakshamantri's residence that the uh, minister wants me there. So I said, Why, what's it about? He said about briefly Kalai Kunda, air strip, uh, air force station, there's something happening. So I rang up the, the um, air force chief. And the air force chief said that, yes, they are coming, but uh, we have not heard of any any Thing because naturally the Air Force will not be told by the political parties that uh, this is not uh, uh, something they don't like. So he said, all right, I'll find out. And by the time I was not even halfway, he found out and he said that this is the thing. And he says, uh, Kalai Kunda airspace is our own and we, we don't require anybody's um, sort of clearance. We'll be able to fly and do the exercises, no, point, no problem. So we, we didn't want uh, uh, this kind of a thing to happen. So uh, I was, I said that you also come along and the air chief also started on his way. And then it when we brief the minister, he says that the state government will have to be uh, given an order. And how do you do that? The, it's a center-state relation. It's a home ministry will have to do. And the home secretary <coughs> was called, and the home secretary <coughs> asked an, an, uh, a signal, a message, and the West Bengal <coughs> government said that since it's a government of <coughs> India which is giving this instruction, because we are part of the union, so if the government of India, central government gives this instruction, then we will say, we don't allow, we don't agree with it, but we will allow. <coughs> now that's a kind of a lesson which I learned, and, and, and this I saw how a democracy functions. And uh, then uh, Mr. Prabhu Mukherjee asked the Prime Minister to have a uh, cabinet meeting. So this I am talking of, uh, the whole thing started at around 7 at, when I was at my sister's place and by 9.30 a cabinet meeting was called and, uh, the, uh, and the issue was discussed and an order given which was communicated by the Home Secretary to the West Bengal government and Kalai Kunda we had exercise. Now what happened was outside Kalai Kunda these fellows with placard stood that they don't uh, <coughs> agree with it and that was all. Then the Americans were asked by the our press that you saw those placards. Can you believe the American officer in charge of that said that we would go to any length to ensure that people can speak, even if they don't like, people can speak. So this is what we've seen and is fine with us. So this is the kind of lesson. Everything was done in a proper manner, according to the rules of business of center and state relations. And it's quite sure that Mr. Mukherjee knew about this, about the way it has to be done, and therefore we did it. And this whole thing in a matter of less than three hours. Now, another uh, similar kind of a thing happened, and, um, and uh, it was another type of uh, uh, incident. Uh, there was this uh, cabinet meeting the next day, it was Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. And uh, Pradeep Gupta, who was uh, assisting the minister, was his OST. He came to me, it was uh, around 7 uh, in the evening, 
and you know we are uh, whole day there are meetings so we work during the after office hours also maybe a great deal of inefficiency but we were working so pradeep gupta comes and tells that sir tomorrow there is a cabinet committee of economic affairs the the matter has not come to the ministry of defense it's a economic uh, thing but looks like there is some some issue in any case tomorrow morning the minister is coming back from a tour so can you go through and uh, and brief the minister so i said okay so i called uh, mr bimal chulka who was joint secretary g the most important uh, uh, joint secretary in the ministry and uh, of operations and everything so and then vice chief of the air staff and some others some uh, air, air operations uh, the naval operations anyway we we saw and read the paper in about half an hour's time we understood that this paper intends giving the information of everything which comes whether it is military or non military into bombay and madras ports so therefore there it is it the person or the organization would have sensitive information and therefore it has to be seen from the security perspective also <laughs> and we did that and then uh, which which uh, organization is uh, is uh, uh, been interested now what is there so i rang up the our ambassador and it was a few hours difference and our ambassador said that give me some time and he said that this is the uh, organization which uh, is getting it and this is owned by such and such so he said that no and next day morning when i briefed mr mukherjee he understood that in about half an hour's time and then he rang up he rang up the minister on rax rax is that uh, uh, direct uh, communication instrument and he told the minister who had brought that paper please drop it and the, that minister also said fine it was this was at certain uh, maybe third third or fourth and he dropped it and thereafter with the nsa with the director ib and all that we did and we did not allow it now this is a kind of a uh, thing if he had missed that then perhaps it would have come to the cabinet and it was not a uh, cabinet committee of security that means defense it was cabinet committee of economic affairs so this is the kind of importance which uh, straight away this gentleman could perceive so at every time one knew and and then he was also quite confident that he will tell the concerned minister please please drop it that was the uh, the language he said that this is coming at uh, serial 5 or serial 4 i suggest that you drop it now similarly he was uh, um, um, uh, many you know this uh, uh, one of our one of our uh, uh, additional secretary one of our additional secretary in the ministry was a gentleman he was very very good and there was no reason that he would uh, uh, go back to the state nobody had asked him so one day he said that i have to go back to my state kada i said who has called you he said nobody i said then why he said uh, mr nitish kumar uh, is becoming the cm then i belong to bihar i want to see that he is successful i want to 
uh, that the Bihar uh, gets a good government. So I said, but then he said, no, I have already written and I have to the Home Ministry and I have asked them to repatriate me. So the department gave him a, a favor. Again, the next day there was this uh, uh, cabinet meeting and I was supposed to brief the Raksha Mantri before the meeting about some other cases. But then I told the minister that at the same time we have a farewell of this gentleman and he is, he is leaving the ministry. So you know what, he just took that paper, he said I keep it like this and he says let's go to the, to the farewell where this farewell is being given. And there, just a f maybe an hour and a half before the, uh, before the uh, CCS or cabinet meeting, he spent at least 20 minutes in explaining how the state governments uh, have to be efficient, they have to work, and he narrated uh, Appleby, Paul Appleby's uh, uh, visit to India, and he had said, he had seen the state governments, and he had said that Bihar was the best governed state at that time. So, he said that this is exactly what uh, the effort of the uh, all these people from Bihar Kader or those who are going back because a good minister has come and a good uh, and they like to ensure that Bihar comes back into the mainstream of countries. Now this is the kind of thing and Mr. Mukherjee uh, applauded that rather than saying that these are not your work. And then of course I had to brief him while I was sitting in the car <coughs> on the way to the cabinet room. So this is the kind of uh, lessons I, I, I kept on learning and, uh, and all over, all over, you know, these days when he was there, there were uh, different experiences. Uh, just now we heard that how uh, he was meticulously writing down also whatever he was seeing. I, I saw that uh, from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock he would in, indulge himself with the official work and after 10 o'clock, so if you had some serious thing to tell, <coughs> then meet him after 10 o'clock every night and uh, he would be as fresh as ever. Then I don't know um, uh, uh, when he would find a bit of a time to eat, but it was huh? very, late. very late. Yes, yes. And and he did that. So he would uh, be <laughs> meticulous in whatever he was doing. He was uh, planning. He was uh, listening, and he was giving uh, orders. He was giving clarifications. So I can go on and on like this. Uh, but I would prefer to listen. Thank you very much and thank uh, the foundation, the extremely good uh, to be a big source of lessons to all young people. India is still work in progress and I'm absolutely sure that we will take India to its ultimate position. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, sir, for giving us such delightful anecdotes uh, about Sri Mukherjee and it's very interesting that you mentioned about that Kalai Kunda joint air exercise uh, as many of you would be aware that my father meticulously left records in his diaries and I'm going through the diaries now so I read about this particular incident in his diary so what you told about it how the government responded but there is a huge political aspect to it and I'm sure Mr. Yechuri would be knowing about it the hectic political uh, associations, negotiations uh, going uh, to uh, about the crisis. But I'm not going to tell you about it now because I'm going to write it in my book 
and when it comes out, please buy a copy and read it. <laughs> now I would like to invite uh, Sri N.K. Singh to say, uh, to give his speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarmishtha. Thank you at the very outset for this privilege of being invited to spend some nostalgic moments of the decades which I had the privilege to work with your father. In fact, decades come back in a kaleidoscope of when I first began working with him. Sarvesha, the house had two parts. The house which he never changed, the 13th Alcatora where he preferred to stay, had two parts. One part was meant for those of us like us wanting to transact the business of government to seek his advice, the other, Sarmishta, <coughs> vibrant with your mother, Sobra, teaching at that time and becoming the cultural center of Delhi in multiple ways. Thank you, Pawan, for mentioning the fact that apart from whatever we know him for, his cultural dimensions, his ability to read, to absorb, to think, and to articulate was something which would be a challenge in even today's information age. So it's that period that I recall. We now talk effortlessly of 5G and the power of technology. But your father, Sir Mishta, had the power of something like 4 or 5G dates, time, events, sequence, came to him with a kind of a memory which would challenge the ability of any modern computer. So that was really what your father did. I had the privilege, said Mishta, of coming in contact with him at a time. When Sita, you would perhaps know that Delhi was ruled by a powerful dominant triumvirate from West Bengal. Siddhar Shankar advised by his redoubtable, very, very talented wife, Maya Ray, another great lawyer, Professor Devi Prashad Chattopadhyay, and of course, your father, Mr. Pranam Kumar Mukherjee. I came first in contact with him when he, at a very young age, have been become a Rajya Sabha MP. Perhaps, I see that you might check up the records of Rajya Sabha. Maybe, perhaps, he would have been the youngest Rajya Sabha MP. He was nominated by Mrs. Gandhi. But my formal contact with him began when he became Minister of State in the Ministry of Finance, and then later, a Minister of State in the Penal Charge. Omita is here and we have kept all these things vivid in her mind, being a, such a remarkable record keeper. But I was working at that time with Mr. Pranab Kumar, uh, not with Mr. Pranab Kumar Mukherjee, but with Dev Shah Chattopadhyay as a special assistant. Things happened fast. There's a change of government. Mr. Pranab Mukherjee stuck to his moral commitments and values. <coughs> he became the principal advisor to Mrs. Gandhi in multiple ways in 1980. And I was privileged we picked up to work as a special assistant at that time. Indeed, that's the time when I saw him at close quarters. And one thing, Pavan, those who worked with him would really know that he integrated you as part of his family. His warmth, affection, and his endearing affection not only for you but for your family was a powerful bond between those who worked for him and those for whom he felt he had an obligation. This was a remarkable, endearing trait of his, which was there till the end of his life. Indeed, in 1980, as he recounts, in his own autobiography, all of which have been printed by Rupa, I found Kapish here. Kapish had done a remarkable job in bringing out several volumes of his autobiography. He mentions in one of them 
that I was the one as a special assistant to have informed him <coughs> of the crash, of the plane, of and the son of Mrs. Gandhi Sanjay. Indeed, it was a long association. But thereafter, I went on to a diplomatic assignment in Tokyo. There was no assignment which I had till the very end when I did not have, in many ways, some degree of interaction. A special assistant to him, no doubt, it was my obligation. And no doubt, I think that you are absolutely right, Shekhar, that files would not remain rest with him. I would send piles of them at night, by the morning, to the back to you with a very definite order, with a degree of clarity. Quite amazing. It was a time when India was an over-regulated economy. The first signs of economic liberalization were not yet in the air. He was a trade minister. But nonetheless, he took, even as a trade minister, the audacious step of the first big joint venture between aluminium Pichre and when he was the minister for steel and mines, a responsibility which he combined with his responsibility as the minister for commerce. <coughs> he was in that way <coughs> looking at the importance of what international trade can do to enhance your competitiveness and to add to India's growth potential. Working in Tokyo, I remained in touch with him as he came to lead India's delegation success <coughs> successively every year to the annual general meeting of the Asian Development Bank as a governor of the bank from India, where he received a great degree of awe and respect given his erudite understanding of complex issues of Asia's development in a broader context. And then, of course, time drifted. And I remained in touch with him even as his own political career evolved. <coughs> Pavan, you use a sentence which comes back to me. You use a sentence that did he receive, and did he receive in time, the fullest possible recognition. You left that question unanswered. And indeed, that question, Pavan, can never be answered. But suppose I pose a different question. People have written about an accidental prime minister. What if that question were turned and said, what about an accidental advice and the consequences of that accidental advice? I leave Pavan that question also unanswered for further work to be done by this foundation which has already commenced its work in such earnest. As the finance minister, no doubt with an office which he served, two terms with difficult complexities, as India went through an important balance payments crisis, as India had begun to seek its place in the world, moving away from mere amelioration of poverty to improving its performance and human development index his ideas and his vision remain indeed visionary. You rightly pointed out that he was a great consensus builder. What better builder? What better example that he was, became the president of India at a time when that Congress party was a party in office. But he became the recipient of the Bharat Ratna by a totally different political party. What do you say when I would say that his career, political career may have begun in a struggle against some of the features and the worst debilitating features of the Naxalite movement and power to the gun was raging through Bengal and yet it's a CPM party which supported him in some of the most difficult bills which he piloted, including the one on India's nuclear thing, where he counted on the left party support, but was sagacious enough to realize that you must have a backup. And the backup came from the support from the Samajwadi party. He could foresee events 
is the great ability to force together contradictions. And in many ways, therefore, he was a unique to the Indian political firmament in bringing the most impossible people together and being able to govern them and forge a ruling, ruling kind of a, a final decision. Mr. Pranam Mukherjee had the great ability to forge contradictions. There was a prime minister who had the great ability to forge contradictions, and I find that great similarity. Mr. Vajpayee tried to bring a consensus with 13 political parties in his cabinet. Mr. Pranam Mukherjee sought to bring about that in a difficult way, with difficult GUNs, both in UPA 1 and in UPA 2. Which you dropped together. I see that great similarity. I see the great similarity between current Prime Minister Mr. Modi and the ability of Mr. Mukherjee in never forgetting a smallest detail and being able to bring about a coherent action. Great political leaders have the great ability to bring about different kinds and strands of opinion into a nation building process. One can go on, but I must end by saying just three more things. First and foremost, Sir Mishra, I was indeed very privileged that in the autobiography, which I have brought together, and one of the last big pieces which were written as a foreword, was a foreword written by your father, who I therefore look back with endearing nostalgia. And in that foreword which he wrote in that book, there are four or five things which he has mentioned in that foreword. And they come not from my autobiography. They come from him. First and foremost, it raises those unfinished agenda which will take India and catapult India forward. First and foremost, Sita, this is something which was common to you and me since I joked with you that today, after a very long time, we will both together speak on the same <coughs> forum, one after the other. Since for six years together, the speaking order in the Raj Sabha used to be either Sita after me or me after Sita. But today, we are again together in speaking. And one of the things which he had mentioned in that forward is the need for reforms of parliamentary rules, procedures, and systems to make parliamentary superintendence over the working of the executive much more, much more responsible than the current situation will be. That is one <coughs> of the finished How to improve? And since Pranapta was the quintessential parliamentarian, parliament was part of his gene makeup. That's one area where a lot more work needs to be done. The second area where I had the great privilege to interact with him much later as the chairman of the FRBM committee which put together the Fiscal Responsibility Management Act, he has said that we need to evaluate afresh <coughs> of what should be the role of public outlays through fiscal, through some kind of a fiscal latitude than still difficult fiscal rules and how do you evaluate a policy considering the macroeconomic stability, which is embedded in fiscal consolidation and in terms of a debt profile, which will be serviceable. Enormous amount of work can be done on this. The third important area, which he had mentioned, is an area dear to him. And Omid, I work with him perhaps also in the Planning Commission, which is very dear to him. Not only the Mukherjee Gadgil formula, which is a change in the sort of way in which resources are being allocated, but going beyond that, the broader issue of center state relations. No one was more deeply conscious. That India is a working federation. It's a union which is a federation. It's a union of states. It is not a union which is there to a different way. It is not. It is a peculiar kind of federal entity which needs, people need to be sensitive about it. What are the mechanisms beyond the Finance Commission, beyond what it can be laid out, it brings together a consultative mechanism 
but in the center in the states, which will make India a vibrant federal responsibility. Finally, I think in one of the films which touched me was his lessons to students as a teacher. And he would have realized at that time, and he mentions this in one of his pieces, what technology can do <coughs> to improve learning outcomes. How can we respond to changing pedagogy, which will make you not educate you once for all, but re-educate you, make you forget, but help you to imbibe skills relevant to the challenges in the, in the 21st century. This was something also very dear to Pranav Babu. I remember him, finally, in awe, in respect, as a mentor, as a teacher, as someone who India was lucky to have in multiple ways, in difficult times, in times not of settled governments. This is a period where government is settled but in more turbulent times, which required consensus building, which required a degree of convergence of action for India's good. India will remember him with gratitude for all that he did. And thank you very much, Samishta, for giving me this. this Great learning experience for me as well. So you talked about solving contradictions in my very short political experiment of getting into politics just for five years. My father once told, told me that in a very diverse and complex country like India and Indian society, politics and governance is nothing but addressing contradictions because there are so many diverse interests and sometimes conflict, contradictory inter interest. So this is the job of a political party and, a, and the government, is to how to address those contradictions, how to manage those conflicts. So it's so nice to hear from you that uh, you think that my father was also, he was trying, he was known as a consensus generator. So thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to request Sitaram Yechuriji to come and say a few words. One who is also, incidentally, my college classmate. I mean, we have different courses, but in college at the same time. <laughs> Mr. Shekhar, that, who is known as a, a very efficient bureau, bureaucrat to serve the country in these capacities, and guessing, of course, as he said, we would follow each other. It's not a question of who comes first or who comes later, but Pavan and K and myself. When we follow to speak in the Raj Sabha, one after the other sometimes, I mean, I think I was mentioning it to them just before we started this meeting. I think we left the Raj Sabha at the right time because today the parliament doesn't function as parliament ought to function. And there's no, in that sense, no parliament worth the name. Anyway, that, apart from that digression, and of course, Professor uh, Dinesh Singh, uh, the distinguished educationists and distinguished members in the audience, well, I was uh, hesitant after such a uh, recollection of various uh, memorable events of those who worked with him in official capacities that uh, I should say something about uh, Pranavda. And since Sharmista made it easier for me, saying that management of contradictions, that is the art of politics, what Pranavda was to do. And that, let me make that the starting point, because I mean, he would always say, Sitaram, these contradictions have to be managed. Tell me how do they handle you, you people in the left. I said, you have handled the left since the days of Hiran Mukherjee. And you entered the parliament from the time I was born. And you are asking me to tell you how to handle these contradictions. Then I said, without contradictions, there is no movement in life. It is the unity of opposites that moves everything. So therefore, you have to sometimes accept also what we say. It's not only that, that you have to find a solution to negate what we are trying to say. So that, that used to be the inside boy, but all that and that. Uh, I used to also joke a little, even what has not been mentioned here, it had a very, very, very subtle sense of humor, I mean, which uh, was, was, was the understated, uh, understated sense of humor, those who worked with him were doubtless, so. 
So one day I was told I had a big laugh at it. I said, uh, when I was editing a student library, we used to do very mischievous crossword puzzles. So I said, uh, those days, as a student of economics, I mean, we always used to talk about what color is the smoke coming out of the pipe just before the budget was presented. That was Pranavda's pipe, which was the subject matter of the cartoons of those days. And uh, we would, I mean, in those speculations, we said that he's a towering personality of Indian politics, which is a fact. I mean, in fact, uh, his life and work are unerasable from the building of a modern post-independent India for the decades that he contributed. But then the puzzle in the crossword would be the, a short diminutive man who would be the towering personality of India's political life. Who is that? I mean, that was the question. And that is it. To call Pradupta a towering personality may physically appear as something incongruous, but that's the fact. I mean, that's what he was. For more than five decades, he had actually played an important role in shaping what was to come, and all these periods, during this entire period, I mean, served in, I think, almost every conceivable position of responsibility, save for one, which uh, all of us know, and what N.K. was trying to allude to for one, one particular uh, comment that he, is, that he made, and that was a mistake, I mean, which uh, eventually led him to that position. But all through this period, even though he was such a senior to me, and even <coughs> though he could have actually scolded me and reprimanded me, never once, and I say it with, almost, with entire honesty, never once did he give a feeling that he was acting like the big brother or the uncle who was advising his nephew or the younger brother to do what ought to be done, but always being treated as an equal. And this was something which is a very, very, very unique uh, quality, which I personally, in my life, I felt. Because the very few elder people I have known to actually treat you as an equal. I mean, that is a, a fact of life. But, but then he would, and he would patiently listen to the point of view. And patience was the other quality, apart from his sense of humor. Patience was the other quality that he had, which is amazing. <laughs> and the elephantine memory, I think multiple elephants, would want to define the product of I mean, he can just through his sleeve, he would bring out to the parliamentary debates what, uh, I mean, Bhupesh Gupta said in so-and-so year in 1957 in the parliament in those records, he said, you go and get it out. I mean, he can just bring out all these fights and use them only for one purpose. And that purpose was to how to improve India, how to take it forward. And there we had all the differences you could ever think of. Even before I came into adult politics, so to speak, when I was in the student's still, emergency, he was uh, Mrs. Gandhi's advisor then, and uh, we had, uh, and I was arrested, I and mean, we were opposed the emergency. So through, through various uh, other interactions, but that was from a distance that, that we would have the, the attack. But then what uh, Mr. Kissing was uh, pointing out today, the Commerce Minister, he presided over India's entry into the WTO and the Dunkel draft process. And actually, which we thought, and we still maintain at that point in time, many clauses <coughs> where it is actually a surrender. <coughs> so then I remember asking, Pranabda, it was you who were in parliament, were actually opposing all these clauses. Then how come it is you today, you are signing on behalf of the government of India? India is not merely agreement but acquiescence, but actually joining the Dunkel uh, Declaration and the WTO on that basis. He said, the times have changed, Sitaram. I am a member of the cabinet, and the cabinet is a collective body, a collective decision. And I, true to my commitment, I am implementing the collective decision of the cabinet. And that was when the 1991 reform process started out. I can see N.K. having a smirk on his face, that because he was the one who was then going through saying that say, India must advance in the direction of competing in world trade. So we had our differences. But, but the, as we all talked about all the qualities in him, but actually it was during the years preceding the Vajpayee government, after the Narasimha period, the United Front uh, period, 
Jyoti Basu being uh, whether to be the Prime Minister or not to be the Prime Minister. And then as, as history had recorded, the two people who could have been Prime Ministers of India who were denied were two Bengalis, Jyoti Basu and then of course, as, as we are talking of. But during that entire period, but it was during Vajpayee government that the urge to try and bring together the secular uh, parties in order to ensure that the idea of India that Pranatha was a very, very fierce proponent of, when he talked of plurality, when he talked of India's multiculturalism, when he talked of and practiced India's multiculturalism, when he accepted without batting an eyelid, not merely inter-caste marriages, but inter-faith marriages, and, and actually celebrated them. I mean, for a person of that to see that idea of India crumbling, after the entire struggle that was uh, waged for the, by the people of India to, uh, to construct such an India was something that he just could not and would not accept. And it was during that period, I remember in 2008, uh, there was this simultaneous elections were coming up for Andhra Pradesh and uh, United Andhra Pradesh and the parliament. And suddenly in United uh, Andhra Pradesh, there was uh, an understanding between the left and the Congress that was developing. And Pranabda was the Congress uh, in charge of the state of Andhra Pradesh then, along with, uh, assisted by Mr. Gulam Nabi Azad, and then of course the uh, Raj Shekharadi, who became the chief minister then. So seat negotiations. So the seat negotiations going on, he suddenly called me aside and took me aside. So I thought he was giving me a good deal of seats. Then he suddenly asked me, what do you think? Do you think I should contest this election? Till then he had never entered the Lok Sabha. He was always a member of the Rajya Sabha. So I said, Pranatha, why are you asking me? I'm too junior to give you any advice or suggestion. But I just cannot uh, tell you. But so they said, no, no, I value. Because uh, but, uh, I, at that point of time, when West Bengal, the government there, the left government there, and things like that. So he said, no, I value your opinion. What do you say? I told him only one thing. I said, Pranabda, if you want to contest elections, you have to be more than 100% sure that you're going to win. Otherwise, please do not contest. Because we are thinking of forming an alternative. And uh, to safeguard the idea of India, then in that situation, Pranam Mukherjee contesting <coughs> and losing would be a big demoralization. So you should not do that. you be more than 100% sure. Then equipped, if you want me to be more than 100% sure, I'll go and ask Jyoti, Jyoti Vasu, that's what. He said, what is his opinion? Do you think I'll be able to win? I said, I can't do that. That's not about this thing. But, but he nevertheless went and won from Jagipur. The first time he became an elected uh, you know, member of parliament. And then after that, of course, as the history of the United, uh, I mean, of the, of the UPA <coughs> shows that, and everybody has mentioned this, he was the main pointsman, troubleshooter, at times Philippa Spring, the discussions where you don't want something to be discussed, and he had a great ability to do that in the, in the parliament. We don't want a decision to be taken by the parliament. You'll have Pran Pranam Mukherjee going on speaking and nobody dare stop him from uh, speaking. So in that, I mean, he played all these roles. And in fact, sometimes in parliament, I think it's on record, I joked at him, somebody said, but these are the recommendations of the group of ministers. So how can you not accept them? I said, I don't recognize that group of ministers because it doesn't have Pranam Mukherjee in it. They cannot, you cannot have a group of ministers without Pranabda there. And that didn't have the idea. He was there in every one of them. Almost, almost every one of them. <coughs> so, <coughs> we had uh, a lot of uh, direction because his theme, which you have seen that in the video presentation, was that Parliament is a sac sacrosanct institution of nation building. You debate, you dissent, but you decide. Without deciding, the Parliament cannot function. And that, these three Ds, as we uh, used to define Pranabda with, was something that he meticulously and sincerely practiced all through his life. And even through parliamentary debates, despite his seniority, would do it. There are many, many, many differences we had, not only the nuclear deal, but on various aspects. And I still remember 2008, I think leading up to uh, the withdrawal 
or were just withdrawn, the left parties, uh, support to the UPA government, the Wall Street collapse happened. And when the Wall Street collapse happened, the Indian economy, many had predicted, is going to collapse as well. But it did not. So I mean, there was a debate in the House on what will be the impact of the Wall Street collapse or the global financial meltdown on India. And summing up, uh, replying to that debate, Pranabda said, the reason why we have uh, not suffered like what was anticipated is because of Indira Gandhi's nationalization of banks. Then they was as the leader of the house uh, speaking, and then I was there in front of him. Then I stood up and said, Pranabda, if you would yield for a minute, I would like to uh, intervene. And with that stature, with that seniority, when I made that request, he yielded. He sat down, which is the parliamentary system, uh, that uh, when somebody wants to interject, the speaker sits down, so they're giving uh, him the floor. So he sat down and said, you're right, because Indira Gandhi, Mrs. Gandhi nationalized the banks. That was a big, uh, what you call, safeguard, a sponge for us to face this uh, big financial crisis. But please recollect, please tell the whole story. Nationalization of the banks came also as a conditionality put by the left for the support of Indira Gandhi's presidential candidate of Mr. V. V. Giri against the official Congress candidate of Mr. Sajiv Reddy, when the indicate syndicate thing was happening. The left decided to support then Mrs. Gandhi and put three conditions, two conditions I remembered. One was nationalization of banks, the other was nationalization of coal. In those days, we were talking, going back to the late 60s. Then he said, so give the devil its due. You know, you also give the devil. It was the pressure of the left that made Mrs. Gandhi nationalize the banks. Otherwise, we wouldn't have voted for Mr. Vivigiri and he would not have been the president of India. Having said this, he sat down. Then he got up and said, you're right, but let me correct you. His memory. He said there was a third condition. I said, I don't know about it, but what is it? He said he was party to all those discussions. And the third condition was the abolition of private persons. And you see, that was also put by the left. You're right. Okay, you may have suggested, you may have advised, you have put the conditions, but Mrs. Gandhi implemented it. It was the Congress that implemented, therefore we saved the day. That was just when we withdrew the UPA. I said, whenever the Congress took the left's advice seriously, it benefited the Congress and it benefited India, like it did at the time of bank nationalization, etc. But this time you have refused to take our advice on the Indo-US nuclear deal. You know not one megawatt of electricity, nuclear energy will be added, which is true even today. Not one megawatt will be added. But why are you persisting with this? Of course, there was a furor in the thing. But he took it in his, uh, you know, in, in his spirit, without any later objections. So we used to have all, all sorts of things. And then the 2009 elections came. I had the second occasion to tell him, give the devil its due. Mandrega, the Rural Employment Guarantee Act, the final year of the UPA-1 government, it was finally enacted. And that, a year later, was the 2009 elections. And the return of uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh and uh, the UPA, it had played a very important and big role. So in the Rashtrapati Bhavan, in the swearing in of Dr. Manmohan Singh's and the UPA2 government. During that swear again, when it was over, I said, Pranabda, at least now give the devil its due. Without the Mandrega, this result would not have been possible. He said, yes. But uh, I mean, he agreed that uh, it wouldn't have been possible because there was great reluctance to spend so much money. And today we know what sort of a, uh, what sort of a safety net it has been, even through the pandemic and et cetera, which he was one of the earliest to recognize. But anyway, I can go on like this on various things, <laughs> but only one thing I'd like to mention, when as I became the president of India, the first trip he undertook was to visit his Sasural, so to speak, or uh, Bangladesh. And uh, Survi, the Ibtut of uh, Mashi, as we used to call her, she comes from there, and he was actually the son-in-law going back to the <laughs> to Bangladesh, and he was received like that in Bangladesh. In uh, Bangladesh, so in that delegation, I was when he had included me, saying that you 
I was told to come and, and we often used to be escape others' attention by speaking in Bengali. So that is what uh, been, the other ministers couldn't understand. So, so we would get away with it. So, but then in the, on that trip, I mean, I learned about his entire knowledge of Bengali culture, the knowledge of Bengali, I mean, were the, the, what you call traditions, so to speak, the behavior aspects, and the entire knowledge of the history of Bengal and the Bengali people. And what uh, we heard Sheikh Hasina say, this, uh, they, they say this, saying that he's a local guardian to them, absolutely. Because Sheikh Hasina had first met her in Jekoslovakia, Prague, in, back in the 1980s, after the, uh, the entire liberation, whatever happened. Since then, he was actually seen as the protector of Bangladesh by, by a lot of people. And then when we visited the traditional house of uh, Ravindna Tagore, he would teach the Bangladeshi officials many lessons on what all Tagore did in that house, which corner and which nook he wrote what. And he actually said, take us to the houseboat where Tagore spent most of his time writing. I mean, he escaped from the house and went into the houseboat to do his writing. And they took us to that houseboat. It was just kept <laughs> decrepitly on the, on the river there. And then he had such intimate knowledge. And this is... Uh, and from there, I had to go back. I had to reach Agartala for the swearing-in of the left-wing government in Tripura, the day the visit to Bangladesh. Ended. He told me, we were supposed to fly, come into Delhi, and I take the flight in the morning to Calcutta, go to Tripura. I said, why are you doing this? It's a, for, it's a three hour drive from Dhaka to Agartala. So he organized uh, the Indian Embassy to send, to, to High Commission to send me by car. My passport was stamped, he got it cancelled. He got my, my luggage out of the plane. And then he said, you take the road and you go, and, and sent me that way. I mean, he would be, he had the capacity to do such even small, small things, along with taking decisions of statecraft, taking decisions of India's uh, future. And that is why today, I think uh, we all miss him. And every day, almost uh, there's, very few days when you don't actually recollect something or the other of, of uh, association with him in life. And today, seeing the parliament, seeing the democracy the way it is, it's all the more that we wish he was there with us to really advise us, tell us how to go about doing things and, and not, not answering questions, saying that will the secular forces unite, will somebody do this, will you all people do that. He said, why are you asking us, what will you do? You know, that would be his question, what will you do? And that was his standard reply to those who wished that better times come. If better times come, we have to work for them. And that working for them is what the biggest lesson that I've learned with my interaction with him. And I think that's all that I can share with all of you, saying that we'll have to work for it. And that working, all of us have to do, like he did always. And I think, uh, thank you for making us reassert this working for it. Sir Mishra, thank you for inviting us. And thank you all for bearing with us. Thank you. thank you very much, sir, for your such an interesting speech. And I think very few of us uh, here were probably aware of the fact that the nationalization of bank, abolition of privy purse, and such major measures were actually some part of our negotiation uh, with the left. So it's a very interesting piece of information we got. And as you were talking about the interaction, uh, uh, the debates uh, which you had uh, with uh, Pranabji, with my father, so uh, parliament was my father's first love. Like, for him, being a good parliamentarian was the thing in his life. And <clears throat> in his later years, he was very disturbed about the way, you know, the parliament uh, had been functioning, uh, ordinances, uh, the way it's been kind of uh, being uh, passed without any proper debates. Uh, but anyway, this is not the time to talk about this, but we just, I, I would like to thank you. And now I would like to request uh, Professor Dinesh Singh to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you.
distinguished guests on the dais and in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. On me has fallen the very pleasant duty of expressing a vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. <laughs> it's memorable for many reasons, as so many of our distinguished speakers have already enunciated. And to that, with the permission of Sharmishtha, I would like to add a personal touch while expressing my vote of thanks. Of course, there were so many facets of his personality, the late Pranam Mukherjee. I also hate using the word late, Sharmishtha. By the way, he was never late for anything. Never. And I never worked with him like each one of you has had the privilege. But I certainly worked as vice chancellor when he was ex officio visitor of the University of Delhi. And I got to know him well. And there were many, many facets which I gradually began to observe and absorb while being with him. He was very patient with me. He was fond of me. And I received much guidance and more importantly, no interference from him. Aap logon ko agar zara bhi andaz ho, anuman ho ki Dilli Vishwadhyale ka sanchalan karne ke liye kya nahi karna padta hai. Vice Chancellor ko tamam tarah ki cheeze rachni padti hai, badi kimate chukani padti hai. Aur jo log संचालन से जुड़े रहते हैं किसी न किसी वजह से दे फॉल दे दे सॉर्ट ऑफ ईल टू द टेम्पटेशन टू इंटरफेयर बट प्रणब मुखर्जी साहब रियलाइज द इंपॉर्टेंस ऑफ इंस्टीट्यूशंस ही रियलाइज्ड वेयर ही हैड टू स्टे ऑन द थ्रेशोल्ड एंड ही रियलाइज्ड वेयर ही हैड टू गिव सपोर्ट गिव सम गाइडेंस but never interference. And you know, agar samaj ka bhala hum chahte hai, to samaj se judi jo sansthaye hai, jab tak we sthir nahi rahengi, unless we nurture them, unless we sustain them, unless we respect them, society will not really do well. And he understood that in such large measure. I saw that first hand on so many occasions. Not just when it was connected with the University of Delhi, but in my private conversations with him. He grew very fond of me. And so we would occasionally have these private chats where there were just the two of us, he was president, and I would always be a little on the edge that there must be other duties he has to attend to. So all those facets that Pawan brought out, this thing about Bhutan, that was remarkable, and thank you for doing that, Pawan. Shekharji, you have to. बताया किस प्रकार से डिफेंस मिनिस्ट्री में जो उन्होंने काम किया। I think the nation owes gratitude to you for remembering and bringing it back to our memory। N.K. Singh सर के साथ भी मैंने बहुत काम किया है कई तरह से उन्होंने मेरा बड़ा ख्याल किया है। सर आपने जो स्तंभ हैं हमारे समाज के इंस्टीट्यूशंस उनके उनका संचालन किया है और जब उनके साथ काम किया तो उसको भी आपने किस तर I'm sure that he was fond of you for the right reasons, as we all are. And thank you for telling me that the left was responsible for bank nationalization, not Mrs. Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, that actually saved the nation. The 2008 crisis, I'm much gay. In any case, you know, मैं दो लेवल पे एक व्यक्ति का तो एक राष्ट्र की ओर से I want to express thanks to his memory. व्यक्ति का तो मैंने कुछ अभी आपसे कह भी दिया, लेकिन जब मेरे ऊपर तमाम तरह के संकट आ रहे थे, मुझे मालूम है all sources, not through him, not through राष्ट्रपति भवन, but through other sources, all kinds of pressure was being exerted on him to intervene, to interfere. To prevent me from doing what I was believed, or what I had believed in, and not once did he express anything. Not once. As regards his memory, I was astounded. The kind of the first time I met him in person was when he visited the University of Delhi. 
for the convocation and I received him at the gates of the university. And I was amazed, sir. My father was at the helm of the University of Delhi in 1975, when he was, I think, the Commerce Minister. And he remembered that occasion. Not only that, he remembered where he had met my father, the building. I didn't mention it to him, but he remembered that. And I will be ever grateful to him for putting me at ease immediately, because I had heard of his phenomenal temper, and I was instructed by Rashtrapati Bhavan to be careful about this and that. But he put me at ease immediately. And that is my personal gratitude. I express my thanks here today. Dusri baat mein chahta hoon, with vishesh roop se, jo thode baat young log hai, mein jatana chahta hoon. You know, Iqbal ne ek baar baat kahi thi, apne kavita mein, ki kuch baat hai ki hasti mitti nahi jahaan se, Bharat ki baat kar rahe thai, Hindustan ki, कि कुछ है लेकिन आज जब सब यहां जो महान बाप बैठे हैं जिन्होंने बताया उनके पहलू जीवन के तो यह समझिए कि प्रजा के सामने आवाम के सामने यह बातें नहीं आती हैं आसानी से कि किस तरह से राष्ट्र का संचालन होता है और उसी में मैं भी एक जोड़ना चाहता हूं 80 के दशक में कुछ-कुछ ऐसा लगता था कि भारत भटक सा रहा है कुछ मनोबल सा टूट गया था मेरे जैसे लोग जो अपने जीवन के करियर के आरंभ में थे थोड़ा सा हम लोग मायूस से रहते थे उसी दौर में भारत ने आईएमएफ का बड़ा भारी लोन लिया था बड़ा भारी उस जमाने के लिए बहुत बड़ा कर्जा था और तमाम चीजें डायर प्रेडिक्शंस वर मेड इंडिया डूब जाएगा इट विल बिकम अ बनाना रिपब्लिक ये होगा वो होगा यू नो दैट लोन was not even fully utilized. It was returned before time because India didn't need it. The negotiation for the loan, the actual utilization of whatever we needed, returning the loan before time, all that happened under Pranam Mukherjee's guidance. He was the finance minister. And you know, that year, when the loan was returned, he was declared by Money Magazine in New York as the best finance minister in the world. India owes a debt to him. And for me, like those people, because I was in America, and I remember, you know, in that think tanks, in the intellectual circles, academic circles, people began to look at India with a certain degree of respect that is not like other third world countries. It does these things, it returns its obligations well on time, before time, so on and so forth. And that is the turning point, I believe, in modern India's history. वहीं से भारत की दिशा बदलती है और उसकी यात्रा ऊपर ही उठती जाती है। So we owe that to him and we need to thank him for that and with your permission I express gratitude to his memory. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Thank you the esteemed speakers. And it was a lovely evening. I would just like to express my thanks and gratitude to all of you once more for being here. And a happy new year and good night. Thank you. <laughs>